the air in there is. Good morning. Man, I hope you all had a wonderful weekend. It's been a fun weekend for us. Uh, but it's even better because now we get to be here in the house of God as the people of God called by His name, called according to His purpose to worship our God and Father, to come before Him boldly without anything holding us back. Not our sin, not our fear, not our doubt, not a government, not the way other people look at us. We are free to come before Him because of what Jesus Christ has done. Let's stand together as we sing. <coughs>
Father, we come before you and we thank you so much for Jesus Christ, for his life that he lived among us, for his death on the cross, and for his resurrection. For if it was not for that resurrection, Lord, we would have no hope. We would have no peace. We would have no forgiveness of sins. He would just be another guy, another failed human being. But he's not. He's your son, 100% God, 100% man, dying on a cross, paying the price for our sin and rising again that we might have hope, that we might have life, that we might have forgiveness. And so, Lord, as we worship you today, we thank you. We thank you because you are a good father, providing for what we need, even when we did not want it. Lord, we pray that you would be lifted high today that you would bless what we do here, that you would be pleased by it. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated.
Last week we began learning a new song. It's called Rescue Story. And if you haven't noticed yet, when we learn new songs, I know that you don't get them the first time. And so we do them a couple weeks in a row so that you can kind of learn them a little bit more. So hopefully this time, y'all did a great job last week singing out. Hopefully this time it'll be even bigger because this is not a song that's just for one person. This is all of us. This is our story. No matter where you were in life, Jesus Christ came for you and he brought you out of the pit of despair. He brought you out of your sin. He brought you out of death. He brought you into life and into light and into hope. So I hope you'll join us as you feel comfortable.
first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, His people says, The time has not come that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time? You yourselves to dwell in your panel houses in this temple to lie in ruins. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You sow much and bring in little, you eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled. You clothe yourselves, but you're not warm, and he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with gold. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land, and the mountains, and on the grain, and on the new wine, and on the oil, and whatever the ground brings forth on men and livestock, and all the labor of their hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Words of Hat and the words of that God the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's messenger message to the people, saying, I'm with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. This story begins in the book of Ezra. You can find a lot of details about this, what's happening in this time period here. And, and Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, there's a lot of detail given. Let me slide this down. Um, Adam Clark's commentary said it's been 68 years at this point since God had judged them and took them off into captivity. And these people knew that Jeremiah the prophet had told them it would be 70 years that he would judge them. He would take them into a land and they'd be captive to a people for 70 years. Well, let's get close to the end of 70 years. And when you get to this point, when the book of Haggai contains five messages that God has sent these people, we're going to look at the first two of them this morning. Right off the bat, you know something wrong in Israel with, with the nation because he starts off like this. He says, in the second year of King Darius, all through the Old Testament, God's marked time by, uh, by the prophets of the uh, kings of Judah and Israel. He'd say, in the second year of King David, in the third year of King David, or King Solomon. That's how time was marked. So you know there's something wrong when he takes a Gentile and starts marking time by this person. Uh, and we date this at somewhere on 520 B.C. is when it was given. The other big thing here is when God judged them, he didn't send them another message until this time. This is the first time that he sent them a prophecy or a message in, in almost 70 years. So this is new stuff for them. So, uh, that's where they are in this place. So in the, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, saying, and here's why he gives the message, verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. Now, this people, that tone right almost immediately lets you know he's not real happy. 
the whole time he was, they were in Egypt, he would refer to them as my people, but here it's this people. And it immediately brings to mind the way some of the parents give up ownership of your children so quickly. And you say, your child is doing this. That seems like the same kind of comment. You can tell there's a problem with their behavior. And you can tell that there's a gap here between what the Lord is expecting of them and what they've actually done. So you know immediately God's displeasure. God's displeasure is pretty evident when you get here. Now, the primary cause of this displeasure, you would say, well, they had not built the temple. And he's not happy about that, but I think there's more to that than just that he's not happy about that. Not only had they not built the temple, but they were using God as an excuse not to build the temple. And you've got to be in pretty bad shape when you blame your faults and failures on the Lord. That's a sure indicator of their spiritual condition. So, uh, <clears throat> but when you put yourself in their position, it's easy to understand. They, they faced opposition almost immediately when they got back. Uh, one commentator said they'd been back for 15 years and the plan was to work on this temple for 15 years. That's a long time to face opposition and to deal with problems. Uh, they would have probably started off excited. They would have, uh, can you imagine being in, in uh, Babylon and all of a sudden getting a chance to do the Lord's work and go home? I can imagine they were pretty excited and fired up about this, only to get there and face all this opposition. And when they faced this opposition, they started saying, well, maybe this is not the time that we're supposed to do this. Now, the Lord told them to do it. But they started to say, well, no, maybe it's not time because we're facing problems. It's easy to adopt that attitude when you're facing problems and say, well, maybe the Lord's not in this. But uh, problems are not the gauge of God's will. If God's got something for you to do, He doesn't promise to make it easy. Anytime you start to do something for the Lord, the first thing you're going to have to deal with is frustration. That's just the fact that anybody that's done anything in church long at all, you'll come to understand that pretty quickly. But one, one guy, David McGee, I love reading about him, he says, saying that it is or is not the Lord's will is a Christian cliche that's covered in multitude of sins. So they gave up. <clears throat> now, God's timing in the Old Testament is fascinating. I won't take the time, I won't take the time to walk to, to prove all this. I'll just give you some good examples. God told Abraham that his people would be in bondage for 430 years. And you go to Exodus, I think it's Exodus 12 in Egypt, when, they, when Israel finally left Egypt, it says they left 430 years to the exact day when they left. Daniel 9 is one of my favorite places to study in Scripture. Part of this prophecy in Daniel 9, the last four verses, Angel Gabriel told Daniel how long it was going to be before the Messiah got here. It was before the Messiah came. In a nutshell, he told him it's going to be 483 years. 483 years later, the Messiah rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and presented himself as a king and allowed himself to be worshipped. And it happened on the exact day it was supposed to. God's timing, when he lays out a specific number, he doesn't get close and good enough. It's, it's, it's exact. And these people have been told it's going to be 70 years that their captivity lasted before they can go back and rebuild the city and the temple. Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29 is where you find them. It's been 68 years now. They ought to be pretty excited about what the Lord get ready to do. Because it's time. And they get to be a part of it. And instead of being excited about what's going to happen, they were discouraged and quit and blamed it on the Lord. Uh, now, Christians, 
Thank you, Lake. It's always a lot of fun to talk about prophecy. When's the, when's the Lord coming back? Well, if you're in the time, if you're in the time that these people live, God gives a prophecy and says the Messiah is going to be here in 483 years. That ought to be a pretty exciting thing to look forward to, wouldn't you think? You've been wondering all this time, and now you know exactly when it's going to happen. That'd be kind of that'd be pretty exciting. And they miss it. You'll find this failure over and over again in the nation. So uh, <clears throat> that's where they are. Now I suspect this time frame is common knowledge for them. Yeah, and, they, and instead of the excitement, I've told you what they were like. But if you want to see what it should look like, read the first part of the chapter nine. Daniel knew what he was praying about. He knew the time. I mean, he was praying about the same time. You'll see an intensity of this prayer that you won't find anywhere else in Scripture. There's a good model there for how we ought to be looking forward to what the Lord's going to do. But sadly enough, that's not what you find here in, in uh, Haggai. It, it kind of reminds you of getting up on Monday morning. If you've got your clock set at 4.30 to go to work and it goes off and you kind of hit the snooze button and you just kind of blow over because heart's not in it. That's the same. That, that'd be the thing. Unless you're getting up to go do something you really want to do and then it gets easy, you just roll right out of out bed. That'd be a good example here. But in verse 3, he says, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses in this temple while in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, Consider your ways. He's calling for a time of reflection to his people. He wants them to take a good look on the inside. No revival or no re renewal can happen until that happens in the life of God's people. And there's nothing different between us today and Israel back there when it comes to this. When you're in a sinful condition, first thing you've got to do is understand that you're in that simple condition. He wants a time of renewal and reflection. That's what he expects from his people. Now, you might say, you might think that's pretty obvious. That doesn't happen, does it? That's a lost art in the church. Uh, God wanted this temple rebuilt, but the larger problem was that they had a heart progress being made on this temple was a sure barometer of their spiritual condition. Now, I think uh, they probably didn't start out this way. Like I said, I think this was a gradual process. Several years ago, Alan Taylor was over the Sunday school ministry at Woodstock, and uh, he made the comment that this would be the sin of preoccupation. You won't find the sin of preoccupation on any of the big ugly lists. That, you know, we've all got this big ugly list of sins that we, they're the ones that send you to hell, right? The one like killing somebody, that kind of thing. This is one of the smaller ones that we tend to want to live with and don't judge ourselves on. But this is what they were, this would be a good description of what they're guilty of. Notice this also. It was their conclusion that since they had the problems, it must not be God's will to proceed with the temple. Do you think they applied this in their own life? Uh, one of the most trying times in life of most marriages is when you build a house. Working on your house. Somebody's going to disagree about something. The color, I don't like this color. I don't like this shape. I don't like, I mean, you did the and possibilities are endless. The contractor's a problem. You took the money. It just never ends. Do you think when this happened to them, they said, well, maybe it's not the Lord that's going to build this house. you think they quit then? They just plow, they plow right through these problems and finish their house. But yet, when they're faced with the same opposition to the Lord's work, they say, well, maybe it's not the Lord's will to do this. There's a heart problem right there with that. Uh, I doubt through that whole process they ever thought that way. God wants them to see their hypocrisy. He wants us to see ours. He doesn't want us comfortable with living in our sinful condition, 
how Sam will stay. Oftentimes, when somebody points out your flaw, your problems, what's the first reaction you have? You want to get offended. Mr. Irvin said I was a cheat. Mr. Irvin said I lied. I'm going to get offended. The first reaction I ought to have is, is to tell it, is it right? Am I cheating? Am I a liar? And is there something I need to change? This is the, the time of reflection that he's calling for in the lives of his people. <clears throat> now, it's easy to analyze others, but doing it for yourself gets kind of tough. But 1 Corinthians 11 31 says that if we judge ourselves, God would judge us. I remember growing up, my daddy would make the same kind of comment. I'd, be, I'd have something wrong, and he'd say, you, need to work, you better handle this or I will. And I knew good and well that if I didn't handle it, I wouldn't like the way it was handled if he had to get involved. We do well remember that. Look at verse 6. He says, You sow much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. But you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is in And he who earns wages earns he who earns wages earns a foot into a bag with hope. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your way. He gives them five examples of how they're faith. These are five judgments. He's not blessing their efforts. They're just kind of spinning their wheels. They're working as hard as they can, not getting it. Now, I want to make sure we don't misunderstand who these people are. These were God's people. These were the, these were the, the cream of the crop here. These were the ones... They had it made in Babylon. They were living well. They had food. And they picked up and moved everything to live in this place where they had nothing, where it was going to be hard. These were the, think of, think of the pillars of this church. That's who these people are. They're not the ones who come on Christmas and Easter. These, this is the cream of the crop he's talking to right here. And this is the situation that they got themselves in. These ways aren't exclusive to Israel. Each one of us face these same issues. When times are good, it tends to grow uh, being complacent. You don't have problems to deal with. You, things are just going, you know, you, you had problems and all of a sudden you don't have them anymore. You kind of get comfortable in that spot, don't you? Uh, they find, these, root, these roots find fertile grounds in times of peaceful good. About 10 years ago, I, I put this message together 10 years ago. I'd been working a lot. And I realized that some things needed to change. My priorities weren't right. And I started, I said, well, I had a vac some vacation time. I said, well, I'm going I'm to do a Bible study just for me. I mean, I need this. And I, I, started, I said, I'm going to get somewhere I've never studied before. And I'm going to figure it out. There, there's a lot of, there's a blessing in that if you've never done it. I highly recommend it. But I started studying this book right here. And I, as I did, I said, boy, he's talking about me right there. That's how script is supposed to work on me. That's how things are supposed to be. Reorder your heart. So, I didn't stand up here today. I didn't write this so I could stand up here and pound on y'all. I'm just sharing with y'all where this came from, how I got it. So, and I'd love to be able to say God gave this to me last Tuesday and he wants me to tell y'all this, but that's not what happened. Um, but things were good. They were having problems. Things were good. They built their houses. They, the next thing you know, they've got all this material stuff how it works with us, the next thing you know, we've got two new car payments, four wheel in the boat, and our hobbies take over our time. God's work gets neglected. God's work is neglected. So look at verse 8. Go up to the mountains and bring the wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. 
And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins. While every one of you runs to his own house. Now, I told you that part of it, you can find a lot about this in Ezra and Nehemiah. He tells them to cut wood right here. And if you go read Ezra 3, verse 7, they had already bought and paid for logs, and they were cut down. Yet right here, 15 years later, he says go cut down logs. Now, we don't know what happened to those logs, but I'm not the only one who kind of speculated this. I read this somewhere else also. He told them earlier that you were living in your sealed and paneled houses. There's some disagreement on exactly what that word means, but in a nutshell, it means you've got a wooden roof on your house. My house is lying here incomplete. It doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to figure out what happened to this wood, does it? That's embezzlement. You can go to jail for that. That'd be a felony for us. And these are God's people. See, when God's people aren't living like they're supposed to live, aren't in a relationship with the Lord like they're supposed to be, the sins they commit look just like that of a lost world. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. And God's judging them and their material things because of this. He says, you work and I blow on it. Now, I'm not animated. I wish I was more of an animated person, but I'm not, but just the, the example would be you just blew on it. It's gone. You, you sit there and work and work and work and you just go blows on it. It's gone. And they weren't, they didn't put these two together. They didn't put these judgments together. So often in the Old Testament when Israel wasn't being blessed, they said, well, maybe I'm not worshiping the right God. I look over here and I see these people being blessed and they worship they They didn't even worship that was their line. I'm not saying that's what these were, but that's the history. So if you get further and further behind, maybe that's something to look at. Maybe God's judging you in your material thing. He says he blew it away. Verse 10, Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, the earth withholds its fruit, where I called for a drought on the land and the mountains and on the grain and on the new wine and on the oil and on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and on livestock and on all the labor of your hands. <laughs> Several hundred years after this, the birth of the church, the Roman <coughs> government persecuted the church in an effort to stop it and the work of the church. And we know the devil was behind that because that's the way he works. And today we don't see a whole lot of that persecution. We see a lot of pros material prosperity. And I, I wonder if the devil had replaced persecution with prosperity. Either way, the result is, is the same. The church has become anything. One of the main truths I'd like for us to see here today is that God judges his people. God's not going to let his people stay in a sinful state. He's not going to let a church stay in a sinful state. If you've got something wrong, he's going to change it. Judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. So that's their situation. That's the reason for the message. And here's the result of the message. Here's the, I told you there were five prophecies in this, in this book. Here's the second. 23 days later, he gives them another message. Now, the first one, keep in mind, we're not, you and I as believers, we know when we're in sin and it's exposed to us, we know 1 John 1 9. That's how we get forgiveness. They didn't have that. This is before the cross. In the Old Testament, they had sacrifices in the temple. That's how they got forgiveness. They didn't have either one. All they had was this charge that was against them. And the Lord gave them this first prophecy and let them sit there for 23 days. And if you're one of God's people and God shows you you're in sin for 23, people, for 23 days, you're a miserable human being for 23 days. 
that's not somewhere you're going to be comfortable with. He gives them this message. It's the sweetest one they, you'll ever hear. Listen to this. Just, they knew they were wrong. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there was an order right here. God's word came to these people and it had the effect it was supposed to have. How do we know that? How do you know God's word worked here? Because their actions changed. If you're a believer, God's word is not something you can ignore. If you find yourself on the wrong side of God's word, you can't stand it until you get in the right work, in the right side of it. If you want to change something. That's where God wants us to be as believers. And if you find yourself ignoring Scripture over and over again, you hear it, you just ignore it, you just go on about your business and it doesn't change anything, you might have a problem. You might not really be a Christian. Uh, I didn't ask permission for this, but John Jr., maybe he's going to, maybe hopefully he'll let me say this. But, um, several years ago, I was big board and Mr. John McKee called us. We were talking about something else. He said, well, I got you here. He said, I, I, don't, I don't like this. I don't think we'll do this thing you're talking about. So I said, well, Mr. John, let's talk about it. We got a Bible out. And we talked about it. And when it was over with, he changed his mind. You say, what's the big deal here? Well, it doesn't happen very often. God's people change when you find yourself on the wrong side of Scripture. God's people change. Don't miss that. Um, so, God's Word changed them. That ought to be the way it goes for us. Um, <clears throat> responding to God's Word is a natural reaction to the regenerate soul. That's the natural thing. If you don't do it, something's wrong. It doesn't bother you something's wrong. In verse 13, Haggai said, this will be the sweetest thing these people could have heard. They sat there and just, they were just in this sand, miserable, knowing they weren't right. And he says, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I'm with you, says the Lord. Sweetest thing you'll ever hear got a way out. The Lord's presence is the most comforting thing there is. So never be. Jesus Christ is the best thing in this world. Amen. He's better than anything you're pursuing. Any hobby you got. So after they change, after they respond to his word, then there's empowerment. Look at verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord their God. Once you see things God's way, He'll enable the to work. That's how grace is. That's what grace does for the church. He wants repentance, He wants change, and then He'll enable the work that He's called us to do. That's exactly what happened here. <clears throat> so many times we expect God to conform to our way like we're the center of the universe. It's all about us and don't change because that's not what we like. God wants us to conform to Him and not the other way around. He expects us to change. Now, this has been the church, but I want everybody here to see that God's standards are different than our standards. We say we're not so bad, 
And he says, you do not even close. Uh, God's standard of righteousness is laid out in the Old Testament in the Ten Commandments. If you want to know what it takes to be righteous, there you go. We all, at the Good Southern Baptist Church, the Ten Commandments, we point to them and say, that's what we believe. But the problem is none of us can keep them. None of us will keep them. One of them says, you shall not murder. And I have never killed anybody in my life. I have never shot anybody, nothing like that. And Jesus, and yesterday, I, I'm not telling you this to be irreverent or be funny. I, we were in February yesterday driving around, and the drivers had lost their mind. People were walking, they were everywhere. And I murdered about four of them over my life what they were. And Jesus said, if you look at your brother and call him a fool, you can deal with your word. That's the standard. See, our standard says, well, I just got aggravated and spit out a word or two, but God says you're the murder of them all. Liars, if somebody here today is not saved, there's somebody in this room that doesn't know their Lord in the right manner. A room this size, it's almost impossible to see the case. You're sitting in a, the Ten Commandments says you shall not lie. You're sitting in a room full of liars here today. Everybody in here has broken that commandment sometime or another. And I'll spare you the grief of going through all ten of them because it's painful. We won't even talk about the adultery and all that, adulterers at heart. But when you stand before God, you're going to stand before He guilty. And your sentence will be held. And that's bad news. But the good news is that some of us are sitting here this morning and we're forgiven. See, there's a penalty that's got to be paid for sin. Some of us, my penalty's been paid. That doesn't make me any better than anybody. It just means my penalty's been paid. And God expects you as a lost person to agree with Him on your sin. And He expects you to turn from that sin and repent. He wants you to place all your faith and trust and hope in heaven and what His Son did for you on Calvary. My sin debt was paid on Calvary. What He did there it was his charge to my account. When the Lord looks at me, He sees me as righteous. He sees me as forgiven and sinless. And you can be in the same spot. That's the message to you. The rest of this doesn't really, have, really had a whole lot to do with you this morning if you don't know Jesus. But the rest of you, this is a message to the church. We're about to call somebody as a pastor. And we're, so, we're good Southern Baptist conservatives. And it'd be my bad of us to call somebody here we don't intend to listen to. You stand up here every Sunday and preach God's Word, we just nod our heads and walk out. Thank you. Throw, throw a dollar in the plate and walk out. We need to get things right before somebody new comes in here. God says, consider your ways. It'll be the best time you've ever had. I'll quit right here. Thank you.
Y'all may be seated. All right. Wow, that's a lot here. Uh, today, well, the, but for the next couple weeks, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. That's all I'm going to say about that at this point. Pastor Keith, it's your day. Congratulations. Uh, Greg Hubach, where are you at? Come on down, Good morning, Annie, y'all. I'm going to come up and talk. We're honoring a special man today. Pastor Keith's been with us for 13 years here at Antioch. And uh, that says a great, great amount to that man right there. <clears throat> um, I'm going to Ephesians uh, 4, 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. To building up the body of Christ until we all attain to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the uh, measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ as a result we are in long longer are no longer to be children tossed uh, here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, 
by the trickery of men, by craftiness of deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and head held together by that which its every joint supplies according to the proper work of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. I, uh, I wanted to read that because that's <coughs> Good representation of Pastor Keith. A man of honor, uh, a man that has raised a family, that is, uh, the majority of his family is working for Christ each and every day. And he's done so much here at our church. Uh, senior snack night, senior trips, Wednesday night services. My mentor, if you will, welcome Pastor Keith and Sandy to the front here, please. Wonderful. 